Our next speaker is Ken Van Golen, who's associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences, uh, and also a senior research scientist at the Helen F. Graham Cancer Center. Uh, Ken is one of the world experts in inflammatory breast cancer and has actually recently won an award from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute at uh, Harvard Medical School uh, for the work that he's done. Uh, he earned his PhD at the University of Texas Health Science Center, did a postdoc at the University of Michigan, and came to UD in 2006. Ken is going to be talking tonight about the uh, Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology. Ken? So, so when Doug asked me to do this, I was actually a little bit confused. I thought since I don't answer my phone in my office that maybe I missed a, a call from Stockholm, but <laughs> apparently not. So. Uh, Alfred Nobel found the fields of physiology and medicine to be so important that he dedicated one-fifth of his will to awarding a prize to outstanding researchers or outstanding advancements in this field. Since 2001, 204 Nobel laureates uh, have been awarded in, in the field of uh, physiology and medicine. And this year's uh, Nobel laureates joined the ranks of such distinguished scientists as Alexander Fleming, Robert Koch, Francis Crick, James Watson, and Otto Warburg. This year, Randy Sheckman, James Rothman, and Thomas Sudoff were, were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology for their advancements in the field of discerning how vesicles move within cells, that is cellular trafficking. So I know there's not a lot of scientists or not everybody's the scientist in here. So eukaryotic cells, or cells from higher organisms, such as animals, plants, and fungi, are all compartmentalized. And they're broken apart, or these compartments are made up inside the cells of a system called the endomembrane system. And this endomembrane system basically creates these compartments so different cellular functions can occur. But materials substances, macromolecules need to be moved between these compartments. And this is the concept of vesicular trafficking. Vesicular trafficking, basically all, all it is, is pieces of the membrane bleb off and they become these little sacs. And these sacs have a cargo inside of them. And then they go very quickly and very rapidly and very specifically to another car compartment and they deposit their cargo in that other compartment. This system that these gentlemen have found, found for, for vesicular trafficking is actually utilized in all higher organisms and actually to some extent in some bacteria as well. Vesicular trafficking is the basis for a number of basic cellular processes. Things like making new proteins, the functional molecule of the cell, altering those proteins or modifying those proteins so they become functional, sorting those proteins and then delivering them to the destination that where they're needed is all done by fascicular trafficking. Other processes such as metabolism, recycling of biological materials, regulation of cell signaling, cellular communication, in uh, uh, nervous transduction, the release of neurotransmitters, or in the immune system, the production and release of antibodies is all done in, in this system, in vesicular trafficking. So the three gentlemen each had individual contributions. Randy Shackman discovered a set of genes that were required for vesicular trafficking. James Rothman unraveled protein machinery that allows vesicles to fuse with their targets, and they permit the transfer of the cargo to their, to their target compartment. Thomas Sudoff revealed how signals instruct vesicles to release their cargo with precision at those targets. So again, the endomembrane system needs to have a very dynamic exchange of materials between these different compartments. And even with the outside of the cell, which releases materials to the outside of the cell and even takes up materials to the inside of the cell. So Randy Sheckman, using a yeast model system, discovered some, some genes that coded for proteins that actually initiate this system. And he found this on a cell compartment called the endoplasmic reticulum, which is found here. This is where, where proteins, a number of proteins are made within the cell. 
These proteins are called SEC proteins, and he's discovered an entire family of them. The formation of these SEC proteins on the uh, uh, membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum then recruits a number of other proteins, which he also discovered, which are called COP proteins or COP proteins. And this specific one is called COP2. The COP2 protein coat, basically what it does is it protects the vesicle so it doesn't come apart while it's being transported. The other thing that it does is it organizes a number of the other proteins that are on the vesicle that help get it to, to where it needs to go specifically. And again, this, is, this shows trafficking of a vesicle between the endoplasmic reticulum, one compartment, to the Golgi apparatus, another compartment in the cell where the protein can be further modified and then sent on its way to its, its destination. Because of this work, a number of other coat proteins have been discovered as well, which are specific for different compartments in the cell. So this is a way that the cell can actually get proteins and other molecules to different compartments to where they need to be, and those, th those molecules can work where they need to be. James Rothman basically found a set of proteins that are expressed on the surface of the vesicles as well as the surface of the compartments that, that the vesicles are going to. And you can essentially think of these proteins as molecular twist ties. As the vesicle approaches the membrane of the, of the target compartment, these molecules interact with each other and wind around each other, pulling that vesicle closer and tighter into the, to the target compartment. Then it actually pulls the membrane apart, allowing a pore to open up, and the cargo can be deposited into the, into the compartment of where it needs to go. Aside from finding this mechanism, he also discovered that there were several different types of these proteins, and these proteins are called SNRs. And the different types of proteins, uh, uh, the, the different types of snares that are expressed on the vesicles, and then their complementary snares are uh, expressed on different compartments, actually allow for a more specific way for the vesicle to get to different compartments and get there specifically and deposit the cargo into a place where the cargo needs to be deposited. This is an image, a very simple image, uh, that it is in a uh, textbook that we use for freshman biology class for introductory biology. And believe it or not, this actually summarizes both Randy Shekman and James Rothman's work. So this is something that we teach to the, to the freshman biology students, but this is two Nobel Prize winners' work, all summed up in one little, one little cartoon, which I think is kind of, kind of neat, really kind of makes us, because I, I actually use this when I teach introductory biology. So you can see the formation of this vesicle, right, with these coat proteins forming on it. The vesicle buds off, gets transported to the, to the target compartment. These proteins, these snares, these molecular twist ties bind. It fuses with the membrane and dumps the cargo in. So this is a very elegant, very nice system. Thomas Sudoff uses a little bit different system. He was interested in how neurotransmitters are actually uh, released into the extracellular space, how the neurotransmitters, these neurotransmitters actually go to other uh, neurons and, and signal to the other neurons or to muscles and signal to them. Neurotransmitters are held in vesicles in a reserve pool in, in the axon bulb of the uh, neuron. And then when a signal is received to release these, they're transported to the plasma membrane where they're released and allowed to signal with the neighboring cell. What he found was is that a, a group of proteins, which are called synapsins, actually link onto the synaptic vesicle that, that holds the neurotransmitter, and it links it to a protein fiber which is called an actin filament. Actin filaments are essentially the skeleton of the cell. And the way this works is you can essentially think of this as a railroad car or box car on railroad tracks. So the, the box car is carrying the cargo, and the actin filament acts as a railroad track. When the signal's received, the box car moves down the railroad track into the active zone and releases the synaptic, uh, uh, 
or releases the, the, the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. Through his discovery of, of synapsins, a whole family of synapsins have been discovered, and these have been linked to a number of different diseases. So this, the work from these three gentlemen has actually produced an entire field, not just describing a basic physiologic process, but also it's created an entire field. And what's even more important about this is the fact that not only has it given us an idea of a basic physiologic process, but it's also given us insight into a number of diseases in which vesicular trafficking has become aberrant. So diseases such as skeletal abnormalities, Alzheimer's diseases, and then some immune function diseases um, all, have, all have ties back to, to defects in vesicular trafficking. And the last thing that I, that I want to bring up is when the Nobel Prize winners were announced and uh, James Rothman was interviewed. This story uh, hit the pages, and if you're writing grants these days, you know it's very difficult to get grants. Well, James Rothman, his grant that actually funded the continuation of his, of his research for which he won the Nobel Prize was actually cut by the NIH. And this is a statement that he, that, that he made. He said, Rothman lost his NIH funding for the research he won the award for, he told the Associated Press that he hopes that the Nobel Prize will mean his grants will get funded in the future if he reapplies. At least he's got a Nobel Prize going for him, right? Thank you very much. I'll take any questions you have. Any questions for Ken? Yes, Tom. They, could you repeat the question, Ken? Because yeah, I don't think most people could hear it. The question was about techniques that were used to, to see these things moving around. Um, there, are a number, there are a number of different techniques that have been used in, um, uh, previously in the, in, in the old days, if you will, when we were using a lot of radioactivity. There was a lot of radioactivity that was, was used in order to trace these. Uh, more recently, it's more like fluorescent labeling of, of, of proteins that are associated with these vesicles. So you can actually visualize the, the vesicles moving using fluorescent uh, proteins that you incorporate into the, in, into the vesicles. So the Can question is, yeah, the, 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 the boxcar and railroad track analogy and whether or not there's different types of railroad tracks that allow different, different vesicles to go to different targets. Yes, that, that is true. Actually, there are three types of cy uh, cytoskeletal elements. There are three types of, of cytoskeletal fibers. Two of those fibers, um, uh, actin and tubulin, actually act as, as, as boxcars. It gets a little bit more complicated because one of the things that's come out with after the, this is really kind of the, the basic groundwork of, of understanding vesicular trafficking. One of the things that others have, have really built on is identifying a number of other uh, proteins that are involved. So there, there are different types, if you will, locomotives as well as different types of boxcar, uh, things that link the boxcars uh, to the railroad tracks. So, but yes, and it's a combination of all that, having different locomotives, different types of, of trucks for the boxcar, if you will. You're welcome. So how reliable is this transport system? Is there any like, lost mail department? Yeah, lost mail department, that's, that's good. It's extremely reliable. Um, it's, it's extremely reliable, and like I said, pretty much all, nearly every cellular function relies on the specificity and the reliability of, of this. As far as the lost mail department, I'm not sure. Lost cargo? So you, you, these cartoons that you showed had some fairly detailed looking pictures of the structures of the, the vesicles with their proteins coating them. Um, how, how much is really known about those structures and how do you get that information out? Actually quite a bit and there's been, there's been um, 
Well, a lot of it's done by modeling. Some of it's done by, by crystallography. Uh, but actually quite a bit is known about the structures, especially, the especially like the coat proteins, for instance. But you can, you can actually isolate the, 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 the combination structure with the vesicle and yeah. the, the coat. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. yes. Any other this question back here? here. Why don't you wait until you get the microphone so we can all hear? Yeah, because I'm not going to hear them from here. I have four kids. <laughs> uh, so uh, I have a question about the vesicle. Um, when you have a compound inside the vesicle, uh, before we reach the target, is it possible they can came out, uh, come out of the vesicle? So that's one of the that's one of the purpose of the coat proteins, right? It holds the vesicle it, it holds the vesicle in intact and prevents it from from coming apart. A lot of times, depending on what type of the, what type of cargo you're looking at. So, for instance, the the the, the image that I showed uh, that I said we showed to our, our freshman biology class actually has a receptor for the cargo uh, in, inside the vesicle. And so it is held in place, and that's one of the other things that the coat protein does. It helps stabilize those, those proteins. Okay, with that, let's thank Ken again.